The aim of uh, this webinar is to share information and raise awareness about different subjects. So we've already done webinar on uh, marine conservation, on the different birds of Mauritius. We talk about climate change, about Mauritius nests. So today we're going to talk about uh, the reptiles of Mauritius. So Denis is going to talk about the different reptile species we have in Mauritius. I'm going to talk about their role and we are going to have uh, Professor Carl Jones join us later on to talk about conservation work on reptiles and bushes. So I'm now going to let uh, Denis start. Thank you, Nicola. Um, okay, so we used to do these talks in French mostly because they were aimed for motion public, but uh, we seem to have uh, quite a few English speakers, so we'll switch to English this time. Okay, I'll uh, start sharing my screen. Right, so I, we titled it Reptiles of Mauritius, um, but we won't be describing only the reptiles endemic to Mauritius. We'll, uh, we'll see all the reptiles you can find in Mauritius, including exotic ones and native ones. Okay, first of all, uh, we'll uh, talk briefly about uh, what are the main uh, reptile groups that you can find in Mauritius. Um, we'll start with lizards, which make the largest group. Um, then we'll talk about snakes, uh, followed by tortoises, and then lastly, uh, crocodilians. Um, so how do you distinguish these, uh, these four different groups? So lizards are usually four-legged. I say usually because there are some uh, species which have uh, reduced limbs or are limbless. Um, the ones that, have, uh, that are immersed as well will be four-legged. Um, they have digits which may be clawed or not. They'll have a tail. Uh, they are oviparous, which means they will lay eggs um, to reproduce. Uh, most of them have high mobility or quite fast at running, for example. Um, the second group uh, are snakes. And um, the obvious feature of snakes is that they don't have any limbs. Uh, they possess scales uh, because you will see later that some tiny snakes can be mistaken for worms. So worms won't have uh, scales, but snakes do. Uh, snakes also shed and molt. Uh, they lose their skin to grow. Some of these are venomous and some are not. Uh, and some are oviparous uh, and lay eggs, and some are viviparous. Uh, they just um, the babies hatch inside the, the mother and then leave the snake. Um, the next group are tortoises. Uh, these ones are easy to recognize by their shell, which is composed of plates or sputes. Uh, they can be either terrestrial or marine. And they are oviparous and they usually dig holes to bury their eggs and they leave them to chance in favorable conditions. Um, they don't have teeth but the inside and the, the sides of their mouth are keratinized, hardened, uh, which enables them to munch on their food. And the last group we'll see are crocodilians. Uh, they are characterized by elongated body. Uh, they are full and have tails like lizards, but um, they also have very strong skulls, uh, wide gape and powerful jaws. And the teeth are socketed, which means they have less chances of losing them when they uh, feed. Or hunt. They're also oviparous, but um, contrary to other reptiles, the parents care for juveniles instead of just leaving the eggs to themselves. All right, so we'll take a look at um, lizards, and uh, within this group of lizards, we'll see uh, a subgroup, that, which are the day geckos, and of the genus Felsuma. Uh, so the first one is the most common you will find in Mauritius, the blue-tailed day gecko. Uh, in Mauritius, some may know it as lizard banan. Uh, it's about 10 to 13 centimeters long, um, and its characteristic colors are this blue tail. It's usually green, yellow, with red dots. Uh, so the red dots don't have any special pattern uh, on it, um, and they live mostly in upland forests and on trees and palms. And so these are endemic to Mauritius. Uh, you'll see. Uh, a classification by the IUCN, which is least concern, uh, which explains uh, the, the commonness of the species. Um, the next one you'll find is Felsuma onata, the ornate day gecko. This one is also endemic, 
uh, about the same size as the Cepediana, uh, you'll find uh, distinctive brown and uh, alternating brown white stripes behind the eyes. And mostly what marks it is uh, the presence of a T-shaped red mark on the forehead like this. And um, contrary to the Cepediana, they will be found mostly in lowland regions, coastal regions. Uh, they have also been classified as least concern. Next, we'll find um, another day gecko, which is uh, a lot rarer, the upland forest day gecko, uh, Felsuma rosabularis. And this one is a bit longer and a bit thicker than the two previous species, 12 to 16 centimeters long. And what characterizes this one, uh, as its name tells you, is um, uh, orange pink lips and throat, rosabularis. And uh, if you look at the head, um, instead of a T mark on the on the front or the forehead, it's a pie shaped mark, right? And this one has recently been classified by the IUCN as endangered. You'll find it in upland forests, uh, and you'll have to look high up in trees to find it. Um, the next one is the lowland forest day gecko, Felsuma gambui. Uh, it's about the same size as the rosa gularis, uh, so about the same length and thickness as the uh, rosa gularis. It also has a pie mark on the forehead, but it doesn't have a pink throat and is found in lowland forests instead of upland forests. And this one is also has recently been classified as endangered. The last uh, endemic day gecko will we'll see is the Gunter's gecko, or round island de gecko, uh, Pelsuma gunteri. Um, this one uh, cannot be mistaken due to its uh, totally different color. It's usually brown with specks of uh, yellow. And it's, it's a lot bigger, 25 to 30 centimeters long. And at the moment is only found on Rhine, round island and Ilozegret. Uh, it was introduced to Ilozegret. It's arboreal and lives on trees. And um, you, it's usually omnivorous, eats other reptiles, small birds, insect fruits, and has been classified as vulnerable. So this is an adult. Um, you can see adults when they grow big have a, a lot loose skin compared to other geckos. Uh, this one here is a juvenile. Also the photo was also taken on Round Island. Next we'll see uh, some night geckos of the genus Nactus. Um, the first one we'll see is the Serpent Island Night Gecko, uh, Nactus Serpent Insula. Uh, it's around 11 centimeters long, and uh, although it's uh, small, it's the larger of the uh, Nactus species. Um, so if you look at the patterns on its body, it is uh, characterized by uh, what you call patterns called chevron. Um, if you're not familiar with the word, it's uh, patterns that look like uh, alternating V shapes with different colors. So the chevron are, are black and light brown. Uh, and as uh, the name implies, this uh, gecko is found on Serpent Island and lives in rock crevices and cavities. And this one is uh, classified as vulnerable. Um, on this photo, you can see the tail of the gecko is a uh, orange color, which means this is a regenerated tail. Right, the next uh, Nactus uh, the night gecko is the Durrell's night gecko, Nactus durellorum. And this one is a bit smaller than the previous one, eight to 10 centimeters long, and is found on Round Island and Ilosha. And the chevrons are more distinctive, if you call it. It's dark brown and alternating with cream yellow. Oops. Um, it's a lot more distinct. Uh, also on the tail is alternating with some white. Uh, it also lives in rock crevices and leaf litter and uh, was classified as uh, vulnerable. Uh, and the last le, night gecko is the lesser night gecko, Nactus quadumirensis. Uh, this is the smallest of the, of the three, uh, around six centimeters long, and is uh, highly cryptic. It's a lot harder to find. And you can see on the photo, even if it has chevrons, they are a lot less distinct. And uh, you can imagine this gecko uh, easily camouflaging on rocks. Um, this one has clawed toes. The most geckos only have, a lot of geckos only have pads, but this one also has claws. And it is found on Flat Island, Gunners Coin, Pigeon Rock, uh, Ilo Vakwen, uh, Ilo Morian. 
and also uh, classified as uh, vulnerable. Right, we'll see some uh, exotic geckos uh, introduced. So the one that you may have seen a lot on uh, the mainland in Mauritius is the giant Madagascar dig gecko, Pelsuma grandis. Uh, it's also quite big compared to our uh, endemic uh, geckos, 20 to 25 centimeters long. And the only colors it has is uh, some bright green and uh, dots of red. And this one lives close to villages or uh, now in town too on our houses and edges of forest. And this one was introduced from Madagascar. And uh, we're still uh, monitoring to see if they are a, a problem to our endemic geckos. And the last Felsuma uh, exotic Felsuma that you can find is the gold dust dig gecko, Felsuma laticoda. And this one's about 15 centimeters long. And uh, this one can be recognized by um, yellow flecks on the body, which the other species don't have. Uh, and this one is found in coastal villages on buildings and trees, and uh, was also introduced from Madagascar. Next, we have uh, the Madagascar clawless gecko. Uh, it's a different genus this time, Ebenavia in Uvis. It's uh, very small, around centim seven centimeters long. And this one is uh, mostly arboreal uh, and sometimes can be found in leaf litter. Uh, the distinct, distinct patterns are spiky scales in rows on the body. Uh, it's mostly nocturnal and was lastly distributed around Bakwa. And we need to do more monitoring to see if they are, they are spread uh, to other parts of the island. Uh, and uh, fun fact, despite its uh, name clawless gecko, uh, females uh, have claws on their hind limbs, uh, but only the females, not the males. Uh, next, we have uh, the Indo-Pacific tree gecko, Emiphilodactylus typus, uh, also very small, six to seven centimeters long. Uh, it's quite slender compared to the others. If you look at the photo, it's not very thick for a gecko. It's found everywhere, but mostly coastal. Uh, also nocturnal and arboreal, and these were introduced from Southeast Asia. Then we have some house geckos, which you, uh, some of you will have in your home. So the first one is uh, one of the more common ones, the stumpfield gecko, um, Gehira mutilata. It's about 10 centimeters long and is uh, very widespread in, in Mauritius. So um, it's distinguished by its uh, mottled pattern uh, on the body, uh, which is more apparent, apparently on dark substrate and during the day. And uh, you can see here that it has a sort of some flap or an enlarged tail at the base, which can help you uh, identify it. And they have a distinctive flap at the back of the rear legs. And these were also introduced from uh, Southeast Asia. There's another photo of them uh, where you can see different colors, uh, but still some mottled pattern on the body. And these are also uh, clawed, uh, pads with claws. And the other very common house gecko you find is the common house gecko, uh, Hemidactylus frenatus. Uh, it's about nine centimeters long, um, likely the one that you see mostly in homes. Um, commonly pink, gray, uh, sometimes a bit translucent, uh, possess claws on, on their pads, and were introduced from uh, Southeast Asia. Next, you have uh, Brooks house gecko, Emidactylus bruki bruki. This one is a bit rarer, I think, and well, I, I've never seen it in towns, maybe in villages. Um, it's around nine centimeters long. Uh, mostly found on, on the coast. Uh, it's yellow pink with granular scales, white tip, uh, white tip granular scales, and they have claws to climb. And they eat invertebrates like uh, most geckos and uh, are introduced from Africa. Uh, you can see on the photo on the tail that they have uh, a lot of spiky um, granular white tip. Um, Okay, we'll see uh, now a different group of lizards, which are the skinks. 
So uh, contrary to geckos, which have uh, a skin, a scaly skin, but um, the skinks have actual scales covering uh, the body. And they're usually quite uh, shiny in, in the light. So the first one is the Telfair skink, uh, the Sanct de Telfair. Uh, and this is the biggest of our uh, endemic skinks. It grows up to about 30 to 40 centimeters long. Uh, and they are found on Round Island. Uh, they've been reintroduced, well, reintroduced to Gunners Coin and to the Zagreb. And they are omnivorous. And uh, besides invertebrates, they also eat seeds, fruits, and other small skinks. And they've been listed by the IUCN by, uh, as vulnerable. And these two on the photo are adults. And this one is a photo of a juvenile. And you can see a bit more clearly on this photo that the, this reptile has scales instead of uh, skin, just scaly skin. In fact, it looks a bit like a snake with legs. Uh, the next one is the Borgia skink, uh, Gongylomorphus borgeri, um, about 11 centimeters long and quite slender. And this one is found on offshore islets in the north and the southeast, uh, and is uh, characterized by uh, generally kind of golden brown color with dark uh, brown stripes, uh, central one and uh, broken side ones. Uh, it hides in undergrowth under, under rocks uh, or in cracks and eats small invertebrates. And has um, this species has recently been classified by the ASEAN as uh, critically endangered. So they need conservation work. And the next skin, skink, that you can find is the Maccabee skink, Gondylomorphus fontenay, uh, about 10 centimeters long, uh, quite slender. And this one is found upland uh, and can uh, be found mostly now only in the Maccabee forest or in its uh, surrounding area. Um, hides under in the undergrowth and under rocks. Um, is usually quite well, light, light golden brown, sometimes with speckled yellow and, and black, and uh, has been classified by the IUCN as endangered. Uh, they are quite cryptic. If you want to find them, you have to make less, a lot less uh, noise and look around in the forest to find them. Um, next one is the orange tail skink. And this one has not been completely described and taxos taxonomists are fighting on whether to classify it as a different species or as a subspecies of an existing one. Uh, it's about 20, 12 centimeters long and uh, it can be easily recognized by its orange tail. Uh, as you can see on the photo, it's very easy to, to identify. It used to be found on Flat Island, uh, but some accident years ago um, made it extinct locally there. So it was fortunately reintroduced to Gunners Point. Uh, and same as the previous ones, hides in undergrowth, under rocks or in cracks. Uh, and because it was not described, uh, it doesn't have an IUCN status. And the last of the skinks um, is the Bouton skink, Cryptoblepharcus boutoni. And is the smallest of the skinks that you could find, uh, eight centimeters long. Uh, it is found on the east coast, uh, in the islets in the north and the southeast, and is possibly extinct in Reunion and Rodrigues, which is why uh, we we put it as native instead of endemic. It used to be found on Reunion and Rodrigues, but we're not sure anymore. And its IUCN status is near threatened. And this one is a a lot more silvery, gray colored, uh, and it's very shiny, right? And just for some uh, other exotic lizards that you can find in Mauritius, and which are some of them co quite common. Um, the first one is the Oriental Garden Lizard, uh, Camaleon, as they call it in Creole, Calotes versicolor, and it's about 35 centimeters long and was introduced from Asia. And it can be found anywhere, uh, anywhere on Mauritius. Needs small invertebrates, fruits, plot material, other rest, small reptiles, and possibly eat small geckos and skinks. Um, the males may take a reddish color during breeding season when uh, they try to copulate with females.
the next one is the Fanta Chameleon, or the Chameleon in French, the one that everyone knows to change colors and camouflage. It's about 45 centimeters long and was introduced from Madagascar and um, is quite easily recognized by uh, its uh, rotating eyes, which can look behind its body. Uh, the long tongue that can flick to uh, catch um, flies and inter in other invertebrates. And they are mostly found around the wild coastal areas. Um, what's particular also is um, the limbs are able to grab and they look like they have hands that grab at sticks to walk. Uh, and the last uh, exotic lizard we'll look at is the common green iguana. Uh, or just iguan in French. Uh, they can grow up to about one and a half meters long, and they are usually native to Central and South America. And in Mauritius, they are mostly, they would have been kept as pets. So if you see one in the wild, it's possibly an escaped one or um, someone who released their pet into the wild. Uh, but they are herbivorous and they eat plant material, flowers, and fruits. Um, it's hard to mistake it due to its size and uh, the spikes on the, on the spine. Uh, flaps are under the throat. Next, we'll see the, the other major group of reptiles, which are the snakes. Um, we'll see the endemic one first. So the last endemic snail that we have left is the keel scaled boa, le bois de l'Iron. Caseraya Tsunyeri. Uh, it grew, can grow up to about 110 centimeters long and is <coughs> round island and gunner's coin. And it has a slight sexual dimorphism where males are smaller than the females. And on round island where they live, naturally they eat geckos, kings, but also seabird chicks. And um, what's uh, unique about this species is uh, they possess an extra hinge in the jaw which enables them to dislocate their jaw and eat bigger prey than uh, they would other snakes would uh, be able to. So this one is an adult uh, and this one here is a uh, juvenile and the juveniles are very different to the adults being colored bright orange uh, instead of gray uh, like the adults. And these snakes are mostly arboreal and they'll eat small day and night geckos, bogus skinks, and bird eggs. Uh, they are currently listed by the ICN as vulnerable. Next, we'll see um, the Brahmini blind snake, uh, which is, uh, as its name implies, is, is, is blind uh, because of a translucent scale covering their eyes. So this one is, is very small. This photo is a big enlargement, but it's about five to 10 centimeters long. And this one is a snake that could easily be mistaken for a worm at first glance. But if you look closely at the photo, it has scales instead of rings, um, which is what snakes have. So it's uh, considered as native, uh, even though it has a large distribution in Africa, Asia, and Southeast Asia. And they could be found anywhere, but they need a most environment. So you could find, find them, for example, under flower pots. And if you find one, uh, don't kill it because it's uh, harmless and it eats ants and termite eggs and larvae. Um, there's another very similar one, which is the slender worm snake, uh, Indotiflops boretus. And um, the difference with the previous one is uh, from a visual aspect is they grow a bit longer, about 30 centimeters long. And these were introduced from India and Southeast Asia, but they follow, they have the same uh, diet. So quite harmless to, to your garden. Uh, so just, just leave them be. Um, next one is the Indian wolf snake, the cooler. Uh, and a lot of Mauritians get confused here because uh, they think couleuvres are something separate and are not snakes, uh, but couleuvres are snakes. Not all snakes are couleuvres, but all couleuvres are snakes. Um, so it's about 50 centimeters long and was introduced from India and uh, could be found anywhere uh, on the island. Um, 
they, they eat uh, mostly invertebrates, but could potentially eat small geckos. Um, a lot of people are, are scared of it, but it's not venomous. Um, and in fact, the, the last snake we see is uh, actually a marine snake, the pelagic sea snake, uh, Hydrophis paturus, and it's the only venomous snake that you could find. Uh, but this one would be on the on 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 the beach or in the sea. Uh, but it's a very rare occurrence. So it grows to about about ninety centimeters long. And uh, you cannot mistake it due to its black and uh, yellow belly, uh, black back and yellow belly. Uh, it's usually distributed in the Indian Ocean and the Pacific Ocean, but could happen in, in motion waters. Uh, it has a tapered body and is, is venomous. Uh, so that was it for snakes. Um, the next group will talk about our tortoises. Um, so we have lost uh, all our uh, endemic tortoises, uh, unfortunately. So the ones that you'll see in Mauritius will all be exotic. So the first one is the Aldabra giant tortoise, uh, tortoise giant Aldabra. Um, the shell is around 110 centimeters long, and it's a uniform gray brown and was introduced from Seychelles. Um, you'll see a bit more with Nicola and Carl, but uh, they could potentially serve as ecological substitute for our lost tortoises. And they are strictly, well, they are herbivorous, usually. Um, they are classified by IUCN as vulnerable. And uh, they've been released on Round Island, Ilozeklet, uh, and a few other parks and gardens. This one is a, an adult here with very pronounced uh, shell plates, scutes. And this is a juvenile, a tiny baby with very flat um, shell plates. Um, yes. Next one is the radiated tortoise, uh, Tortue radiée, um, Strochelis radiata. Um, this one is a lot smaller than the Aldabra tortoise. Uh, the shell is around 35 centimeters long, and they were introduced from Madagascar. Uh, it has a very distinct shell pattern with uh, star-shaped yellow stripes, which give it, gives it its name, radiated tortoise. It's uh, also herb herbivorous and is actually uh, critically endangered, as listed by IUCN. Uh, so if they are in Mauritius, they should definitely be protected, even if they are an exotic species. Um, this one is an adult, and this one is a juvenile. And even as a juvenile, you can see the patterns on the shell. Uh, the next one is uh, the red eared terrapin, or tortue de Flori. And this one is a uh, very different uh, in a very different situation uh, compared to the first two. This one is highly invasive. Uh, it goes to about, the shell goes about to around 20 centimeters long and was introduced as pets from North America. And back in the 80s, they were very popular as pets uh, until kids get bored and release them in the rivers uh, where they multiply and can uh, and cause problems. Um, they have a very distinct red streak behind the eye. Uh, and the body is covered with the pale uh, yellow green stripes on the body. And they are uh, omnivorous. Um, another one which, uh, which is a lot rarer is the wattle necked soft shell turtle, the Atotua carapasmol, Paleas um, daimdachneri. The shell is around 30 centimeters long. And um, this one was introduced from Southeast Asia, and it would be found in rivers and muddy areas, mostly around in the Mocha range. Uh, as with any exotic or invasive species, it would be good to monitor their distribution to know if they've spread to other parts of the island. Uh, and they eat mostly invertebrates and small fish. And uh, lastly, we'll have a look at some turtles uh, so marine tortoises. Um, the first one, the hawksbill turtle, or la tortue imbriquée. 
Uh, it's about a meter long and uh, is just distributed worldwide uh, and can be found in motion waters. Uh, so it has a very char characteristic shear pattern uh, and arrangement where the plates seem to overlap each other. And it has a slightly elongated head and a pronounced beak uh, giving it its uh, name. Uh, it's native to our waters because um, the tur well, turtles are free to swim wherever they want in the waters. And they are classified as uh, critically endangered. Um, in some places around Mauritius, uh, these, uh, uh, these turtles are poached and eaten. Um, and that puts them uh, at risk of uh, extinction. Um, next, uh, the last sea turtle that you could, found, could find in, in motion waters is the green turtle, the La Tortubert, um, Kelonia Midas. Um, it's a lot bigger than the previous one. Uh, it can go to around a meter, 15 centimeters to a meter and a half long. Again, it has a worldwide distribution, but can be found in, in motion waters. Uh, and this one doesn't have overlapping uh, plates as uh, the hawksbill turtle and has a round head with no beak. Um, this one is classified by the ICN as endangered. And lastly, the, the last group of uh, reptiles we'll talk about are the crocodilians. Um, technically, they are not in. <laughs> in the wild, uh, but they can be found at uh, Lavani Nature Park, but it's worthwhile mentioning them. So the first one is the Nile crocodile, Crocodile du Nil. It's about three and a half to five meters long, and uh, was introduced from Madagascar to Lavani Nature Park. And the natural environment would be rivers and uh, river banks. And so if you find one, you call Lavani uh, immediately for them to fetch it. Um, so the difference between uh, crocodiles and caimans or alligators is that they have a long snout and that the lower teeth um, lodge upwards into uh, the upper jaw. Uh, so if you find teeth uh, going down and uh, overlapping over the upper jaw, you have a crocodile and not a caiman or an alligator. And the other one that you could find at Lavani is the black caiman, the caiman noir, uh, Melanosuchus niger. Uh, it's a bit uh, smaller in length, three to four meters long. And was, this one was introduced from the US to Lavani. And again, would have natural environments in rivers and banks. So this one, as you can see on the photo, has a shorter snout, um, shorter snout and wider jaw but you, don't, we won't, you won't find any lower teeth jutting upwards. And uh, that was it for a uh, presentation of the reptiles that are in Mauritius. Uh, so if you want any uh, resources where you could find these species, you can look on the IUCN Red, uh, Red List page. And some of them are presented in uh, books like General Fauna, uh, Imogus Fauniflor, uh, there's a book on reptiles, a field guide to reptiles and amphibians by uh, Nick Cole. Although I'm not sure it's in bookshops at the moment. And uh, thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Denis. Uh, that was a good exhaustive uh, turn of all the reptiles we have in Mauritius. So what I suggest is that if you have questions, you can already type your question in the, the chat and uh, I think we'll come back to the question at the end. So now I'm going to present on the role of and the importance of reptile in motions. Sorry, I got a little problem. Okay. So Mauritius, as we all know, was uh, never colonized by 
mammals. So the only mammals that colonized were the, the bats, but it was colonized by reptiles and birds. And thus, most of the role that would usually uh, be uh, uh, taken by mammals in other ecosystems were taken in Mauritius by the reptiles and the birds. So most of them fill all the different niche. So of course we know uh, the difference that happen. For example, uh, birds, we have the dodo that uh, was doing lots of the roles and same for the reptiles. So this meant that we had quite a bit of a different uh, suit of reptiles in Mauritius. And usually all the, the niche were either filled by reptiles or by birds. So the, the main role of the reptiles is usually, usually has a main component of food webs. They are found in the different level as pollinators, as seed dispersers, and also as grazers. So as a main component of food web, the reptiles plays a major role in the different level of a food web. So I'm going to show you one of the examples. It's a study I did in 2005 while I was doing my PhD where I look at the diet composition, the number of prey, the electivity indices, and the genetic niche overlap among the different reptiles around Allen. And also, I also look if the diet vary between adult and juvenile. And this was able to and illustrate to show how important reptiles play a role in the food web, especially on round Allen. So what uh, we did, so during a, a year, we collected the uh, fecal sample from all the different reptiles. And we did uh, either belly massaging, as you can see the first picture. Then we look under microscope at all the different uh, uh, components that were found in the diet. And based on scales or different things I say, we created a library. So we knew afterwards when we look at the different fecal sample at what, uh, what they correspond. So basically we also collected uh, information on the different uh, reptiles and birds, plants and invertebrates that there was on Round Island so that we could work on electivity. So electivity is an index that measures the diet selectivity and it's usually based on the abundance of food web and also what is found in the environment. So I know it looks complicated, but I'm just going to explain. So that's the food web of uh, Round Island. So at the top, the orange one is the kill scale boa, the adult skill scale boa. So you can see it uh, is the main uh, predators. Then you have the telfair skinks. Then you have the Gunter Gecko, and then you have the Juvenile. So just to explain quickly, I know it looks quite complicated and we're not used to this type of food web because you usually have it well, uh, well set up with little lines that brings. So down, you have all the different types of plant species, all the different birds and all the different invertebrates. And then this shows the different types of uh, reptiles we have and all the connection the larger the bar is, and the, the more interaction there was. So as you can see, on Round Island, you have the reptiles that play part in all these different, so at all the different level. And also, which is interesting, what we found is that, for example, the diet between the adult and the juvenile uh, differed. So for example, a adult, Telfair skin would eat a juvenile uh, kilske boa, but would not be able to uh, eat a adult telfair, whereas the adult telfair would be able to eat. So you can see that it changes based on if they are juvenile or adult. And this makes that you have at that level quite a big difference on the different level of food webs you can get because you have one, two, three, four, five levels that you can obtain because some of the level are double with the reptiles based on their age. So here is just a, a difference in the different food item consumed. 
So we can see that uh, between the adult TFA and juvenile, there's not much difference. For the Bojo, there's a bit more. Whereas the Dero and Ad Gecko, we have quite a big difference between what the adult and juvenile eat. Same for the lower one. So this is to illustrate that based on the size, the amount of prey you get is going to differ. So you're not going to get the same amount of choices. And here is a bit of the same, but it's just to represent. So basically the green are the same. So these are the uh, food item that comes from plants and the orange are invertebrates. So you could see, and the rest of the colors are usually the, the over gecko. And we can see that, for example, most of the tail fair skin, the budget skin, only the gecko, they eat quite a different varied diet, whereas the kill scale is quite specific. So the adult, these two blue ones are birds. So they eat birds, but whereas for the juvenile, uh, kill scale, they would feed mostly on uh, over reptiles. So this is the electricity. Again, don't worry too much, but it's just to show you that there's some specific prey that way. So there's a change. So some of the species will specifically uh, select some of them to eat, whereas others, where you see there's not a big mark, is that they, they are quite, uh, they are not selective on it. And here's more uh, a interaction of the diet overlap. So then again, the darker you have the line, the more the interaction is strong. So we can see, for example, that's the Burgess King, so that's adult and juvenile. And you can see again that it's really interlinked. So that is to illustrate that the reptiles play a really a big role in the uh, food web on Round Island. And we, without that amount of uh, reptiles there, you would not have this strong uh, food web and at such amount of levels. So the second step is pollination. So again, uh, in other places you would have uh, uh, over pollinators, but in Mauritius it's mainly done by uh, reptiles and birds. And one interesting fact was that we got colored nectars. So we think this colored nectars was developed because most of the pollinators were birds or reptiles. So this was more attractive and they also have a different vision so it's more a good signal. So an experiment was done by Ansan and Al. And what they, they thought is that they saw that, uh, for example, the colored nectars was more selected uh, than clear nectars. And it shows that there was a clear preference. And it can tell us that these two, uh, the, this colored nectar has been really developed for uh, geckos. So, and we have quite a lot number of uh, plants that have colored nectar. So it shows that these plants uh, evolved to be at attracting reptiles. So we also have uh, quite lots of pollination, which is done around the island, which there is quite interesting because it's done specifically by geckos, but also lots of the stings do it. So the tail fair skinks are quite a big pollinator of Latania trees on round island. And on the mainland, we also have quite an interaction where you have uh, where you have uh, quite a lot of interaction where it's done mostly by uh, reptiles. So one other very interesting part is uh, that they take part in seed disperser. And we have here the Roussea simplex, which is quite an interesting plant because it's pollinated by geckos, Cepediana, but it's also the plays a role as seed disperser. So they, dis they pollinate the, the, the flowers and then they disperse its seeds. So that's quite a, a very interesting role to show the strong uh, relationship that you have between motion plants and motion reptiles. So just to illustrate the role there, that used to be uh, played by tortoises, but like Denis said, we lost all of our endemic tortoises. And what was found was a study done by Griffiths and Al, and they found that uh, 
There were lots on Ilose grape. There were lots of nature trees, which had seedlings under these trees, but they were not uh, spread. So tortoises were reintroduced on the island. And with putting back uh, tortoises, they started to see that the tortoises were eating the fruits of the ebony tree that were falling on the ground. And they were starting to uh, disperse them in the feces. And usually these usually germinate quite well. So what uh, Griffiths and I do, so they look at the different plant uh, and see where there's a uh, So they look at the map, all the ebony trees where they had seedling in and where seedlings were found. And then they map to uh, areas where tortoises, where there was a dispersal, like you can see on the pictures, that's quite specific of tortoises and to see uh, where they were. And they found that with the introduction of tortoises, as you can see before, there was no uh, spreading around. And once tortoises were introduced, they started spreading the uh, ebony trees around Elizabeth. Grape. And to add to that, foods that have been ingested by the tortoises, usually they germinated quicker than the one that had not been ingested. And while I was doing my PhD, I found a, a sort of similar result uh, with the tail fair skink. So I look at uh, the effect of ingestion on freshly fruited species. Even if you can see on this picture that there's a tail fair skink eating a pandanus seed, which is not uh, freshly fruited, but they were still quite attracted to it. And I also look into the mechanism to see if what was responsible, was it being ingested or another factor? So I set up a fully factorial uh, experiment with 30 replicates and it ran and we look and what we found is that I separated the different into endemic native and exotic species and we found that in terms of germination time for the endemic it reduced but for the two of us there was not a, a mock effect why well, sorry uh, I didn't enter. so the white is not ingested and the gray is ingested so we saw that the one that were ingested the germination time was reduced for the endemic species. In terms of per certain germination, so the amount that germinated, for the endemic, it really uh, increased. And we sh it shows that, for example, the endemic at really a good, uh, the germination really increased. And that was a bit the same for all the species, but mostly more for the endemic species. So it shows really that there was a, a strong relationship with, between the tail testing and these different species. And for the survivorship, that's also a quite interesting result at the time. We saw no difference uh, for the endemic species, but for the native, it increased the survivorship of the native. Whereas for the exotic species, this was decreased. So the different species that we looked was the Lomatophilum tomentori, Myopora motionum, and Pondanus verdemershi. And when, that's just a, a, a summary. So, the plus means that it was a positive effect, zero, no effect. So we saw on a number of days, uh, it had an impact on for Ilsenberger petiolaris and for Premna, but also for the exotic Solanum nigrum. But in terms of percentage germination, it also increased for this species and also Solanum. But in terms of survivorship, didn't have any positive effect, but it reduced the survivorship of passiflora and so, so on. So I tried to work out what was the different uh, effect. So you have the different treatment I used. So there was fruits, it was deeper, so just deeper by hand. So that were good passage, others not good passage. And then if they were with feces or no feces, and what I found out was, for example, the main impact that helped endemic in terms of germination time was that it had to be either deeper or good passage. And for the two of us, for exotic and native, it was mainly two if they were good pause, 
So being good boss made but, but the germination time increased. In terms of percentage germination, it's again for the endemic mostly due to deep up and gut passage. And for the exotic, it was mainly done to gut passage and for the native deep up. And when we look at the percentage of ship and what came out, like I said, for the exotic species was that again, it was deep up. So I didn't have time at the time to uh, investigate that more, but all I know is that when Delphair used ingested native seeds, usually there's a positive effect. And when they did negative, uh, the exotic sorry, there was a negative effect because the survivorship decreased. So reptiles also played a major role as grazers, but that was mainly done by uh, tortoises. So Griffiths and I did a study where they look at the in, uh, impact of reintroducing tortoises on uh, Brown Island. It was an enclosure study. So different tortoises were uh, put in six different enclosures and we monitored above ground biomass percentage cover, plant abundance, plant composition, plant reproductive output. And what we found that was in terms of height of trees, so this reduced for the rigid, the rigid tortoises and the adabran, but there was an increase for the control. Same for the number of adults. For the number of flowers, also it decreased the amount. For the vegetation cover, also decreased. Same for the number of seeding. And, and as this vegetation on round at the time was mostly exotic, that's why there was a positive effect of grazing and that they could help to control weeds on Ron Allen. So here you have an example where that the study done on Ron Allen, where you have tortoises that graze and they create what you call tortoise loan or grazing loans. And on the side, there was a control where you see there was no uh, grazing at all. And always adding to that, being grazers, they also help dispersing seeds of native palms and trees and by avoiding also the native trees and palm seedling. So they're helping actually with the restoration of the island. So we also did a little study at Ebony Forest where we released four adabatotoses over six weeks and we look at the different plant that they fed on. And uh, what we found was that uh, they selected mostly uh, exotic species compared to native or some that were not known and just found. So that's also quite encouraging because it tells us that we did reintroduce tortoises to islets, but they could also be a solution to be reintroduced to forests to help with the different role they have. So controlling exotic sea, uh, plants uh, and also dispersing sea. So that's all I have to share with you. So what I'm going to do now, and I have the pleasure to uh, introduce Professor Carl Jones, who's going to talk to us about uh, conservation work that has been done on the motion reptiles. Over to you, Carl. Thank you very much. I hope I can uh, work this. I'm not very good at these technical things, as you're probably aware. OK, I'm going to give an overview on reptile conservation in Mauritius. And actually, I feel like I'm a bit of a fraud because compared to some of the other speakers, I'm an absolute rank amateur. But I have been involved in conservation in Mauritius for four decades. So I've seen a lot happen. And all I will do today is to give you an overview of some of our approaches and what we're actually trying to achieve. And it's really quite interesting because if we actually look at what we've done here, we've been very, very pioneering thanks to the work of uh, Nicola, uh, Christine, and all the others, we've done a huge amount in recent years in understanding the ecology of some of our reptiles and also how best to conserve them. Okay, what did Mauritius look like in the 15th century? This is something we've all been thinking about. What was pristine Mauritius like? We've all heard about the dodo. 
And in recent years, a huge amount of work has been done looking at the paleoecology, looking at subfossils and trying to work out what Mauritius was like. And that's actually quite an important question because if you're doing conservation and you want to try and restore lost ecological interactions, you've got to have some understanding of what the original system was like. And here we have an illustration by Julian Hume, which basically is guessing what he thinks the island would have looked like. And you can see huge numbers of birds, lots of tortoises, and elsewhere, hidden in various places, you can see other reptiles as well. And this is quite interesting because Mauritius was dominated by reptiles and birds. We don't have any land, native land mammals in Mauritius. The only land mammals we have are bats. And hence the ecological roles that are usually filled by mammals have in part been filled by the reptiles and the birds. And as we've heard from Nicola, they fulfilled a whole range of different roles. Predators, scavengers, pollinators, seed dispersers, grazers, and browsers. And this is actually very important. Because when we're talking about conserving species, we're not only talking about saving that taxonomic unit, but we're also thinking about the ecological roles. And by increasing a species which is really impoverished or bringing back a missing species, we're actually reactivating its ecological roles in nature. And what's quite interesting, or what's very interesting, is we actually don't know what the results of a lot of our manipulations are going to be. But it is quite exciting that the further we move away from pristine Mauritius, in terms of the number of centuries that go by, we seem to be understanding how the ecology worked a lot better as time goes by. And that's actually quite an interesting process. And as I've suggested, and as you've heard from other speakers, reptiles were important components of the ecosystem. And in the masquerines, they were, in fact, um, hang on a second, I can't quite see my slide there. Okay. The masquerines had one of the richest terrestrial reptile bi diversities anywhere in the world. And this was because it doesn't have mammals. And because of its great age, we had a huge diversity of reptiles. And within the masquerines, we had at least 31 endemics. You can see that there's a bit of doubt there. It's because we're still arguing uh, how many species were here and what, what were, they, were they exactly. But what is really interesting is that we have lost a large number of species since the 16th century. We know of at least 17 extinctions. And that's 40% of all the, all the known global reptile extinctions. So the Mascarines is a remarkable place. We've lost a large number of important species. Um, and the reason for that is, of course, because of habitat destruction. And most people will be familiar with these maps showing forest cover in 1773 and 1997. And today, we only have small vestiges of native forest left. However, despite the losses, despite the extinctions, we still have a rich reptile diversity. Those reptiles are found, some of them are found on the mainland, but a lot of them are found on some of the offshore islands, as, as you've already heard, and Round Island being one of the most important. However, the surviving reptiles are actually imperiled because of the impacts of introduced species. And of course, this is a problem worldwide. But here in Mauritius, we seem to have some 
pretty pathogenic exotic species. We have rats, we have house shrews, we have the kule of there, the Indian wool snake, which is a very effective predator of small skinks. And we have other species of lizards like the agama lizard that compete and predate upon some of the native species. We know that when rats get introduced to islands, we lose a lot of native species. And in fact, when you look at the history of Mauritius with the introduction of rats, several species disappeared. And also with the introduction of the wolf snake, we saw the disappearance of some of the small terrestrial skinks. And similarly, when shrews have been introduced to offshore islands, we've seen the disappearance of some of the native small lizard species. Because so much of our, or so many of our reptiles were imperiled, in the 1970s, a captive breeding program was set up for some of the rarest species. Gerald Durrell came and collected animals for his zoo in Jersey in the Channel Islands. And he was particularly interested in the keel scaled boa from Round Island, and also the Telfish skink and Gunther's gecko also from Round Island. And it was felt at the time that these species had a very uncertain future due to the long-term degradation of Round Island. However, Jerry Durrell made a commitment and he said, you know, taking animals and putting them in the zoo is not really the answer. It's a short term approach to conservation. And what we really need to be doing is to ensure, ensure that their natural habitat is secure. And Round Island, as we all know, is very precious on the north coast of Mauritius. However, it's become greatly impoverished because of the impacts of rabbits and goats. And in the 1970s and 80s, it looked like many of the species that were found there, many of the endemic species would disappear because of the impacts of rabbits and goats that they were having in eating the vegetation and causing widespread erosion. This is a photograph taken in 1984 when we visited the island to do a feasibility for getting rid of rabbits from the island. And you can see there was very little soil, the palm savanna was disappearing and there was very little ground coverage other than just a few tussock grasses. We were able to get rid of the goats by shooting. And then in 1986, we hired a team of New Zealanders. New Zealanders are the best people in the world for getting rid of exotic animals off islands. And this team of three people, which you see on, on the left hand side, they came to Mauritius, they went and lived on Round Island for 10 weeks, and they poisoned the rabbits, and they shot the last rab few, few rabbits. And this group was led by Don Merton, who's there on the left-hand side, who actually was a huge influence on our conservation work here, and showed us the value of the offshore islands, and also taught us a great deal about island restoration. And we must pay a great debt to our colleagues in, in New Zealand who actually helped show us the way forward. They were able to get rid of the rabbits in 1986. And after getting rid of the rabbits, we saw rapid regeneration of native plants, but we also saw rapid invasion of exotic plants. And most of these exotic plants have been exceedingly difficult to control. And it soon became clear that if we wanted to actually manage Round Island and look after the reptiles, we had to have a presence on the island. So we built a field station and we've had a whole team of people working there over the years, including several of the people who are speaking this evening that have been helping with this restoration. And today we're beginning to see Round Island coming back to life. And this is an aerial photograph and you can see patches of green where we're seeing natural regeneration and also regeneration which is being helped by us 
planting um, some of the native species back into the wild. So gradually we're turning round island green again. And the result of this has been that we have seen the recovery of the palms and hardwoods. And if we look at these two photographs, one taken in 1972 when there were rabbits and goats, and another one taken from more or less the same place in 2003, you can see there's been spectacular recovery of some of the vegetation. And the result has been that we've seen a huge recovery in some of the reptiles. And you don't have to absorb all this data, but just to see that there's been a massive increase in all the species. These are estimates and people disagree with some of these figures, but you can generally see that the upward trend, well, there's been a very significant upward trend and all, over a thousand percent increase in reptile abundance on Round Island. So you, we can very well say that Round Island is proving to be a wonderful example to other places in the world about how to conserve reptiles and how to restore a whole system. Inspired by the work on Round Island and realizing the great value of many of the islands around Mauritius, since 2006, we have been, whoops, sorry, 2006, we have been moving reptiles onto some of our offshore islands. These are islands that have been cleared of rats, mice, rabbits, cats, and so on. And we introduced seven different species, or should I say translocated seven different species of reptiles onto 10 different islands. And in total, we've re reintroduced more than two and a half thousand reptiles. Most of these translocations or reintroductions have been highly successful. However, some of them have been challenging. And one of the islands that we are working on a great deal, of course, is Ila Zagret. And generally, most of the projects there have been very successful. However, we note that Ila Zagret once had Boja's skink, which is the skink you can see at the top of the picture. The skink is found on Round Island, it's found on lots of other um, islands around Mauritius. And we know it is found on, on Ile Zagret because subfossil remains have been found. And it's an ideal site for the Boja skink. However, it has the Kulev, the Indian house snake, wolf snake, and it also has the house shrew. And we know that both these species have caused the complete extinction of Boja skinks on several islands. And our efforts to remove these species of Ila Zagret have proven to be unsuccessful. So there's still a huge amount of work to be done to learn how to manage some of these islands and to be able to get rid of some of these invasive species. However, a lot of our other translocations have been very successful. We've taken Telfis skink from Round Island. We've put some on Gunners Coin, where they're doing exceedingly well, and we have a very large population there. And we've also put a population on Ila Zagret, which unfortunately hasn't done very well, presumably because it still has house shrews. So you can see we've had some spectacular successes, but they're also a number of other challenges. And an approach which we have done, and you've heard tonight about how we've been using tortoises, exotic tortoises to replace native tortoises or ex 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 uh, endemic tortoises that have become extinct. This is an approach that can be applied further. And if we look at some of the extinct species, we can find possible species to replace them. This beautiful painting on the left shows Felsuma Edward Newtoni, Edward Newton's Felsuma gecko, 
which was from Rodrigues. And from its morphology and from looking at its teeth, we can see that it was probably similar in ecology to the Ornegei gecko that we have on Mauritius. So it's quite possible we could use the ornate day gecko as an ecological replacement for the extinct Edward Newtoni. And similarly, Rodrigues also had a very large nocturnal Felsuma gecko called Felsuma gigas, which disappeared after the introduction of cats to Rodrigues. And we think that we could actually use the Gunther's gecko, which we found on Round, which we find on Round Island, to, to replace it. And we know from genetic studies that Gunther's gecko and the large Gigas gecko from Rodrigues were very similar or very closely related. And it seems possible that perhaps one day we can introduce Gunther's geckos to Rodrigues to replace the extinct giant nocturnal day, uh, night gecko that was once there. So you can see there are lots of possibilities. By restoring islands, by getting rid of invasive species, and by doing translocations. And when species are extinct, there's always the possibility of ecological replacements. Although noting that when you do use e ecological replacements, you have to exercise great caution to ensure that you are putting back the correct species. And if we look at Mauritius and its long, sad history of extinctions, we can see there are possibilities for rebuilding those lost systems and using ecological replacements. And I think Round Island is a, a wonderful example of what we can do. But there are lots of other things that we can do in the future. Mauritius also had a browsing tortoise, and there's still a browsing tortoise that exists in the Galapagos. So perhaps we can use that one day as an ecological replacement. And Mauritius had at least two species of flightless rails, and there are still flightless rails that exist elsewhere, including one that is still found on Aldabra. So we may be able to use the Aldabra flightless rail to replace one of our extinct forms. And a species that I'd really like to replace is the mascarine booby. This is a species which disappeared in the 1830s from the Indian Ocean. And we know that it was very closely related to the Abbott's booby from Christmas Island. So we can bring that back. So the work that we have done on the reptiles is showing how we can rebuild systems how we can move species around. And when species are extinct, sometimes we might be able to replace them with other species. So although Mauritius has a hugely disrupted ecology, and we see that there have been massive, massive changes over the last 500 years, there is great hope in the future that we can rebuild systems. And we've heard about COP26 and people talking about climate change and how we can reverse it. Well, one way of helping to reverse climate change is by rebuilding ecosystems. So I can't help thinking that here in Mauritius, with our modest attempts at rebuilding systems and using ecological replacements, we are beginning to show the way forward. And with those, those last thoughts, I'd like to thank you all very much and to show there is great hope in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carl. Very interesting talk. So what we suggest now is that you can take some questions for the speakers. So I've seen there's already a question for you, Denis, so from uh, Marcus. Thank you, Denis. Nice talk. On what basis do you consider the Indotyphilus brahmus native to the mascarine 
for example, in Réunion, they are considered exotics. I was, I was hoping you could answer this better than me. Uh, okay, from, from what I've been trying to research and read, um, yeah, it, it's, there's a lot of um, dispute among taxonomists on whether they, are, they should be considered exotic or native. So, um, yeah, maybe I should have left it as a, a debatable status. Uh, so what's, what's your opinion on it? Well, I think we just need to see, people need to research, and personally, I, uh, I think we need, I, I don't have really opinion on that. So then there's a question from Teresa, and I think that's for you, Carl. Any plans to try again to eradicate shoes from IAA? It's lovely to get a question from Tree, who actually has worked on Elis Agret, so she knows it very, very well. Uh, yes, wouldn't we love to get rid of the shrews? Um, everything we've tried hasn't been very successful. Um, but let's hope that as we learn more about the shrews, we will actually come up with a way of getting rid of them. We are talking to a number of people about doing some further studies on the shrews. And of course, when you're trying to get rid of an animal that doesn't belong somewhere, the first step is get to know your enemy. So let's hope that in the future we can understand the ecology and the population biology of the shrew enough that we can get rid of them. So yes, it's something we're thinking about all the time, but it's an uphill battle. And you know, it's quite interesting because we've learned how to get rid of rabbits and rats and hares and cats off islands. And we can get rid of ungulates like sheep and goats and cows and so on but there are still lots of invasive species that are very, very difficult and are a great challenge. And I think, you know, those are one of the great challenges in the future. But I'm sure that given time, we will be able to um, get rid of some of these species we don't like. Thank you. So I uh, don't think if there's any other questions. So if you want us to answer some questions, please write it down. If uh, Okay, so we got one from Lui. Uh, I think that's also for you, Carl, who I can also tap in if you need. What is the problem with the gunters on round? They go from 1,000 to 3,000, and the tail fares go from 5,000 to 45,000. That is a big difference. But yeah, I'll let you answer, but I can uh, also Nicholas tap in. can answer that. He's, <laughs> he's the expert. <laughs> okay. So basically, the, the main reason this is that gunters are really. Uh, linked to latanias and also tall latanias. So if you saw in the pictures of, of that Carl shows, so the latania grows not very quickly. So that's something, and they are territorial with different territories. So I think with time, the more uh, you get latania spreading everywhere on the island or over plants, I think that's going to spread and the number is going to increase. And uh, Based for the tail fares, I think the main thing was they were limited by uh, food. But now that there is more food on the island, that's why the population has increased. And also, there's a question of clutch size. So, gunters have uh, two to four, six eggs. Maybe we have uh, eggs per season, whereas the tail fares, they can get up to 15 eggs. So, also, there's a major difference there. So, I hope that helps your question. Anything to add, Carl? Uh, yeah, you've, you've explained it really very, very well. Um, you know, um, Gunthus is quite a specialist gecko, and Kelfish skink is, you know, very generalized, and I think uh, that's the answer. And then there's a question from Kesha. Thank you for the great presentation. Is there any plans to control the Madagascar gecko in Mauritius and any studies on them versus native on indigenous plants? So you want to answer Carl or Denis or you want to? Um, I think you can answer that. There's been a lot of studies on them. Yeah. Um, so, I don't know what all the answers were, but yes, we are looking for ways of controlling them. Yeah. I don't think we will be able to eradicate them. And I think we're just gonna have to learn to live with them. Mm. But what is most worrying is their impact upon some of the native species. And we've seen they do have an impact, but perhaps with careful management, and if we have really well restored native vegetation, our native species will be at a competitive advantage. 
But perhaps there's an advantage, a long-term advantage to having Madagascariensis because hopefully one day the Mauritius kestrels will feed upon them and the Mauritius kestrels will be able to increase and come into the lowlands and feed on Madagascar day geckos. Whether that will happen or not, I don't know. It's one of those dreams that I have. But let's watch this space and perhaps one day it may happen, who knows. And also one thing that we've seen in terms of distribution of Madagascar they have not been uh, colonizing or coming into the forest, the, the, the good native forest, you're mostly on fringe where you have settlement and they live close to people. So I think as long yeah. as it's doing that, that should be a good thing for us. But uh, yeah, like Carl said, let's see, but keep an eye on. Okay. Uh, then that's one, one for you, Carl, from Marcus. Do you think, do you think for an ecological replacement for uh, Fesma Edouard Nietzsche, size matters? Uh, first monata is quite a bit smaller than the Edward Newton was. Yeah, of course. And uh, I was only putting that uh, example forward to be provocative. I think the more we think about these things, the better. Uh, I'm not really suggesting we do it tomorrow, but I'm just saying we should be looking at Felsuma to try and find a suitable species. Um, I think probably the best is actually Felsium ronata, but of course we'd have to do a lot of very careful studies. And we really don't know what the ecology of Felsium Edward Newtoni was in any great detail. So a lot of this is guesswork. And of course, ecological replacements is a, is a very high risk thing to do. And you've got to, it's got to be done very carefully. The advantage with tortoises is that if they're a problem, you can take them off. But when we come to some of the other species, we're going to have to be exceedingly careful. Okay, any other questions? So I think we don't have any more questions. So, okay, if we don't have any more questions, I would say thank you, Dennis. Thank you, Carl, very much. And uh, thank you all for those that assisted to the webinar. And uh, of course, we'll work on more with you and come back to you soon. So thank you very much and good night, everybody. Thank you all very much. It's been a lot of fun and great to see all the wonderful work that's happening here.